Okay, on to the show, Season 2, Episode 37. Enjoy. My guest today is Professor Paul Larson. Across the last two Olympic cycles, Dr. Larson was employed as lead physiologist for high-performance sport in New Zealand, alongside a joint position as adjunct professor of exercise physiology at Auckland University of Technology. This unique role positioned him at the nexus between theory, research, and application of sports science and physiology for Olympic sports in New Zealand. While he continues his professional role, he is now based in Canada as a coach and consultant and has amounted more than 125 scientific publications. Professor Larson is also launching Hit Science, a soon-to-be-released book and online course all about the high-intensity interval training and its application in sport. Prof, really appreciate you taking the time today. Hey, cheers, Dr. Bubbs. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Well, uh, perhaps we can uh, start here by you telling listeners a little bit more about the genesis of this big project, this uh, collaborative project you have in uh, Hit Science. Sure. Sure. So Hit Science, I guess, uh, it's, it's got a little bit of a long history. It's um, And it would stem back to when I uh, was a triathlete myself, became a failed triathlete. And, uh, you know, I, I, um, I was trying to, I, I guess I had the Simon Whitfield dream and I, I wanted to do what he was doing. And, and uh, in, in terms of winning, uh, you know, gold in the, in the Sydney Olympics, that Absolutely. was kind of on my, that was on my radar and that didn't work out for me. And, uh, it, I guess it, yeah, I left a level of kind of frustration in me and, but I quickly, div, um, transferred that, uh, that passion over to trying to understand the science a little bit more. And I went into sports science and I guess, um, my research went to, uh, uh, took me to Australia and did my doctorate there. And it was really on the, um, I guess, trying to understand interval training and, and really, I guess my, my, uh, my big, my question at that time was if interval training was so effective, then what's the best interval training format to give you the most bang for buck uh, in a session? And that was a lot more difficult of a question to answer than I realized. Uh, and it's, you know, I think I probably, I don't think anyone really still has the exact answer today, but for that's sure. really what, what, uh, what 20 years of, of research in the area has kind of taken me to is, uh, and with, with hit science. Uh, and I should also say that, uh, along that journey of 20 years, I, I ran into, uh, a colleague from France, uh, Martin Bichette, and he was having similar questions as, as myself. And, um, except he kind of took, he has, he, ha, he came at from, from more of the team sport side of things. And we joined, uh, I guess we joined forces and put together, both um, uh, a literature review that was published in Sports Medicine that uh, encompassed uh, the science and application of high-intensity interval training, all the different ways we say you can skin a cat when it comes to interval training. And yeah, I mean, uh, and, and I guess that that literature review led to a, a book that we're publishing with Human Kinetics Publishers. And we, uh, I guess when we were doing the book, we said, you know, it's one thing to put words on page, but there's lots of other means of learning like Absolutely. podcasts, like, uh, like video. And, and we, so we got to make a course out of this and that's, that's why we've got both, uh, both the book and the accompanying course that we're, we, we hope to release in, uh, in December this year. Yeah. Fantastic. Really exciting projects and looking forward to just looking at the outline there at, uh, you know, all the content, especially on the individual sport and team sport side of things. And, you know, before maybe we dig into all this, something that I hear all the time from our performance staff at Canada Basketball, and, and I hear all the time from experts like yourself, is this idea of, you know, first really understanding the demands of the sport and the athlete profile. Uh, can you speak a little bit to the importance of those fundamentals? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, the so so yeah i guess it's one thing to say that uh you know you need to have a certain interval training format to um uh to go at your to go at your problem of trying to enhance performance but but yeah you absolutely um the the context we always say context is everything and um yeah we we definitely um you you need to really start with uh the the person that you have in front of you and their and their their own profile. We're all individuals, as you know, and uh, there's going to be certain individuals that have certain capacities, whether it's you know aerobic capacities and anaerobic capacities and neuromuscular profiles and body sizes. 
Uh, and then you need to match that with the sport demands. The, you, know, you know, we've got uh, so many sports out there, and it's not there's no one fo- one size fits all approach for interval training or a- any training for that matter for any individual. The, it's you know really kind of comes down to that individual. Um, and then yeah, the other thing you're always thinking about too is the the long term aspects of this. Where are we in the in the calendar of our, of our training and what's the most appropriate interval training, um, session to have at this, this place at this time. And then also that that's, you know, on a similar, uh, means it's, it's what's the, what phase of the periodization plan are we kind of in? So all of those, uh, in terms of an overarching philosophy, all of those different, um, aspects sport demands athlete profile ad- long-term adaptations and periodization should all come into um i guess determining really first of all what what your physiological objectives are of the session and um yeah from there i, I mean that's 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 probably where i can kind of go to our our first uh, the first thing we should probably speak about is is how we're breaking interval training down into our physiological objectives yeah, I mean that would be that'd be great. I mean, last year I had Dr. Martin Cabal on the podcast, and of course he talked a lot about the history of HIT training and a lot of the traditional methods of programming. But I think it'd be great to get listeners on the same page here by describing some of those, yeah, you know, those key areas that could be targeted with HIT training. Yeah, cool. So, and I, I don't know, I haven't seen too many, too many out there really take this approach. And and uh, again, credit to Martin Bichat for for this uh, this idea, but. Uh, and I think as you know, it's Einstein when he said, uh, you know, everything should be made uh, as simple as possible, but no, but no, no simpler. So we really kind of yeah, take uh, hit training. Yeah, we really take hit training down into three key, um, I guess, targets that you can that you can get after when you're doing any sort of uh, interval training program. So one is uh, one that's kind of broken down to two is that metabolic aspect, and I'm sure you know, I'm pretty sure your listeners will be aware of. Within metabolism, there's there's generally aerobic and anaerobic components of that. So those are really the first two. So the uh, you know a, a hit session is going to have a, an aerobic oxidative component as uh, as as one uh, key target that you could be uh, you could be going after for your session. Uh, two, it could be having a, an anaerobic glycolytic type uh, type target, uh, and then the third one that's not always appreciated, but but is it's definitely is with the the team sport individuals they they know about this one but it's the neuromuscular and uh, musculoskeletal mechanical type strain that occurs in various hit sessions you you'll know that dr bubs bubs from your um your, your basketball kind of uh, sure. programming and whatnot right like there's the is pretty high neuromuscular musculoskeletal damage and demands with with any type of basketball sort of training so that needs to be managed accordingly so it, what winds up uh, happening is you can break the the hit sessions down into i guess those three uh those three targets and you can have different degrees you're always going to get a blend of everything but you but you can have like a, a it's, sometimes it's weighted a little bit more in favor of one versus the other one one's dominating versus the other or you can have them all dominating and that winds up creating six types of of um, target types. We call them when we're when we're trying to plan out an interval training program. And I'll just take you through those. I'll just list them. So the very first one, and I'll try to give you some examples as well as we kind of go through these Fantastic. these these different types. So we'll, we'll call it five five target types, five hit target types that I'm going to list here. And there'll, there'll be a sixth one at the end, but it's not actually technically hit. I'll explain that one last. So the type type one of it, of uh, hit training is really that first. Um, it's it's a type that's really just going to be oxidative, uh, and it's not going to be eliciting uh, too much of a neuromuscular strain, and it's not going to be eliciting too much of an anaerobic glycolytic load. And how you might do that is um, is re- having actually really short interval session so what winds up happening is if you're if you're having like little 10 second bouts of high intensity i I, we should actually also um, not forget to define high intensity interval training we're talking about exercise that is performed kind of in your red zone um so you know above that uh the so-called anaerobic threshold 
right? So that's, it's, yep. it, you know, we, we often, and we, we get that confused a lot, um, especially me and my, uh, you know, I've got an Ironman triathlon kind of background and forte. And a lot of the sessions that, um, that my Ironman guys do are kind of, uh, they're more in, they're, they're below what would be called the red zone or the anaerobic threshold. They're more in that aerobic threshold kind of zone sometimes. And they're, they're efforts, but they're not high intensity interval training. High intensity interval training is really above that critical power or critical speed or, or, um, uh, lactate threshold, so to speak. Um, so it's when there's, there's really, um, anaerobic metabolism is going to start to be turning on if you help, if you, if you hold it up there too long. So back Perfect. to type one, type ones, remember aerobic oxidative. Now these are, so the, the intensity is, is up there. It's around the VO2 max type, um, uh, intensity. So it's, it's hard work, but it's only on for like 10 seconds or so, 10 or 15 seconds. And then you turn it off for another 10 or 15 seconds. And if you repeat that, what's really interesting is that you don't wind up getting too much of a glycolytic load and you don't mind up getting, uh, wind up getting too much neuromuscular strain. Um, but eventually if you keep repeating those 10 on 10 offs at that high intensity, you will start to raise heart rate. You will start to, um, uh, get, uh, you know, an oxidative, uh, contribution to the muscles, uh, yeah. and, and a cardiovascular load, um, just stay with it. Right. You'll, you'll see. And, and that can be, um, I guess, yeah, it's, it's, it's I guess, um, when we're going from type one to type five, we're going in, in order from low to high, um, I guess, strain overall, overall strain or stress, if you want to, uh, d- describe it like that. So terrific. Yeah, that, that's the that's the type ones, and you could you could imagine, you know, especially in the ba- basketball con- context, how you could do that type of type of conditioning. You could do it with ball work, and uh, but yeah, it's just it's you know ten or fifteen on and ten or fifteen off, and just keeping the but keeping the glycolytic and the uh, the neuromuscular um, strain load at that point in time. And prof for people in the team sport side of things is, you know, some strategies like, um, if they're outside, you know, running on grass or just using regular, um, you know, sneakers rather than cleats, are those also strategies to help with uh, reducing that neuromuscular demand? Absolutely. You got it. So that was, and as we move actually, that that's a great segue to move into type twos because, um, now if we move into the type twos, we could, um, change the terrain. Now type twos have both that same, aerobic oxidative uh demand but now we're getting some neuromuscular strain into it as well we're bringing that up and exactly as you said it's uh now we're 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 bringing on um you know we might might have a little bit of change of direction in there the the um the pavement might be hard as opposed to being on grass uh or it would be running as opposed to cycling cycling would be low um, neuromuscular musculoskeletal strain and uh, of course the running and change of directions is going to be higher uh, neuromuscular musculoskeletal strain for sure and, shuttles jumps and all that stuff you got it, it all those different things so th- those are all would, would all be kind of considered a type 2 target for your for your programming um, and that yeah that's that's really about it and and then again continuing on down the uh, down the down the road we move to the type 3 one and uh, the type three, we have a high, you know, aerobic oxidative. We also now have a high anaerobic glycolytic contribution, and we have a low neuromuscular uh, or musculoskeletal strain. So in this one now, we're we're going the opposite way in terms of the the musculoskeletal strain. We're taking all those things off. We just added for the type two, or yep. it could be a could be a cycling workout, could be a grass grass running, could have low changes of directions, no jumps. But now we're adding on, uh, we're lengthening out the time at that high intensity, for example. So it's high intensity, longer durations. Now we're up and around you know, 20, 30, 40 seconds up, uh, you know, almost towards a minute. And now it, you'll, what, what you'll find with these when they're repeated is now we're really sort of, uh, we're adding into the, um, uh, the glycolytic uh, system. And we're, we're, you know, I guess we see a lot of lactate buildup at this point in time. Definitely. So, yeah. So, and, and again, this, you, you can imagine this in your, in, in certain contexts as being certainly very important because, um, there's, you know, loads of different, uh, sports that require, um, those types of kind of durations and both of those systems to be, uh, to be functioning and working very well to, to need to train those. 
Yeah, great, great way to work some of those systems, like for, for ice hockey, for example, without having to strain that neuromuscular system, right? That's right. Exactly. Exactly. But, um, for sure. And, and I guess that's the key thing as well is that the, these, all these three targets, they're going to have kind of different time courses in terms of their recovery. Uh, and, and that, and probably the one that's, that's harder to hardest to play with, uh, is that neuromuscular one. And that's why a type three can be really valuable. Um, if you're doing a type three session that doesn't have a low or sorry, it doesn't have a high neuromuscular strain, it can be kind of still really quite valuable to have programmed in because yes, you're, um, yes, you've got a, a solid, um, glycolytic load happening and an oxidative load, but it's limited in terms of the neuromuscular strain and you can still recover that system if, uh, any sort of neuromuscular, um, whatever has either been before it or, or needs to be fresh, fresh for something that's like a performance coming after it. Definitely. Um, yeah. And then the, the, the next one is, uh, we call this one our weapons of mass destruction, uh, <laughs> interval target. And that's the for type sure. four and this is all out. And that's, so that's, uh, everything's everything lit is, up. everything's lit up there. You're oxidative, you're glycolytic and your, um, your neuromuscular musculoskeletal and, uh, the, the, a really good example for this one might be your, um, a lot of people know what VO two max intervals are. So it's kind of, it's kind of balls to the wall for two to four minutes. Um, and then it's, yeah, pretty grueling efforts, pretty, you know, um, and they're, they're, they're hard, but I mean, again, in the right context. So, you know, we'll use these for our, our runners, our, our triathletes, our cyclists, especially towards the sort of the peaking end and where they need to be able to, uh, prepare, for um events that are that are that you know that's right in their wheelhouse right like they need to be good at that Definitely. so um yeah so those are um again but but that is sort of the type four session you're going to probably fit um you'll feel it afterwards but yeah everything's lit up and it's it's you're all in kind of thing for for those repeated efforts and vo2 max is a great one uh, and prof, that. Is, is that, um, you know, oftentimes now in, uh, in, in football, soccer, as they, we call it back, back in America, uh, back yeah. home, um, a lot of the small sided games that they use now in, in training and practice, would that be a type four as well for, for this type of, uh, hit session? Well, it, de- it really depends. Right? Again, smaller um, so spaces and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, um, game based interval training or small sided games is, is one of those ones where I think you, you can have uh, generally type two through type four targets on any of those. It really just depends on how creative how you want to get with your, with your small sided game. That's right. But certainly your traditional, I think your traditional small sided games would be, would be falling into that, uh, that type four category. Absolutely. Yeah. But again, if you, um, if you, you know, you could still do a, t- a type three session if you, um, uh, if you coordinated it so that it didn't have a lot of changes of directions, you know, it was done on the pitch if it, and it was done, uh, at the right sort of, sort of time course. Um, uh, you could do it in sand. So there's different, there's different sort of ways to take off that neuromuscular strain, maybe more challenging in, in some contexts, but, but it can, it can be done. And, and same with the type twos as well with small sided games, you could really just take the breaks down. So it's like, um, yeah, it's a very, very sort of quick, quick games, but it's like there's, um, they're, they have the exact same sort of sequencing, um, in the type two category as, as we said before with that shorter, you know, 10, 15 seconds sort of on and 10, sort of 10, 10, 15 seconds off. Yep. So that's, that's still sort of possible depending on how creative you want to get with your programming. Terrific. And then the last one is the type five, and that's the uh, um, so now th- this is an interesting one. This is really this tends to be sort of exclusive to um, all out um, re- either repeated sprint training. All right, so repeated sprint training might be like your uh, repeated, you know, seven repeated seven all out seven seconds, and then um, resting for say twenty or so twenty seconds, and then you're doing that again. Um, so in these sort of situations, you're, you're starting to get a little bit more, um, uh, anaerobic glycolytic when that, when it's repeated and it's all out as well as the neuromuscular strain. And then the other one, uh, is when it's, uh, is the sprint it's called, uh, they're called sprint interval training. And these are ones that probably, uh, Marty Gabala would have, would have mentioned when, you know, you're there, they're, um, 
they're all out for 20 to 30 seconds. Yep. And, uh, and, but there's, and then there's a really long period of, of recovery, usually between two to five minutes kind of thing. And then you repeating, you know, you're, you're all in kind of thing for, for 20 to 40 seconds or whatever it might, might be. That's a sprint interval training kind of session. Those would be considered a type five. And again, they're quite damaging in, in terms of the, uh, the, usually in terms of the musculoskeletal strain, um, although not maybe not as bad when it's done on the on the bike, uh, and then okay. certainly there's going to be a large glycolytic and lactate load from something like that as well. Yeah, I mean Martin mentioned that huge delta being such a key trigger for a lot of those uh, adaptations that take place, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, and then I guess if we want to take the next, uh, the very last target that we can sometimes have is the uh, is the type six target, and the type six target is the um, is is really it's not technically high intensity interval training, but uh, we'll probably talk about it a little later when we talk about the um, I guess how you program in strength training, and it's it's really either strength training or speed training, like maybe in the sort of the sprinter sprinter kind of context it's just like uh you know very short uh all out sprints kind of thing but not enough to to elicit like a uh, a like uh, a lactate or glycolytic load um so that would be your type sort of six target that you could uh you could play with kind of in your programming and there's yeah and i, I guess just looking at it this way at least from uh, for us it helps us with a little bit of yeah it helps us with thinking about how we might program and, uh, and that's what we want to teach. And that's what we want to hope that people will take from this. And, um, yeah, we really want them to think more, f- uh, physiologically based as opposed to a lot of people think, and I, you know, I was probably even guilty about this when I was explaining this, but uh, at times, but, but a lot of people, we, we think that, um, format first, and we don't think of physiological target type first. We think, Definitely. oh, we'll just throw Workout a, we'll just throw a, Right. We'll throw a sprint interval training session in there. We'll we'll throw a repeated sprint training session. We'll 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 put a VO, VO2 max uh, set there, and that's not well. We don't believe that's totally the right way to think about it because there's loads of ways to skin all of these types of sessions. And uh, yeah, I guess knowing first of all how how they work to elicit these three. Uh, target responses can give you the practitioner a little bit more power when you're when you're going to program for your athletes we believe yeah 100 percent. i mean definitely uh, having those fundamentals and understanding of, of what's going on is so crucial to then applying uh, the formats as you mentioned and of course you know once a practitioner understands the demands of the sport they understand the athlete profile um, and I imagine this is where the online course will be terrific because you'll be able to get into some real depth and detail and with the book as well. But in terms of incorporating this into an athlete's training, um, you know, whether it's individual sports like endurance, team sports, obviously everything is – contexts are changing every single time. But are there some potentially general themes around appropriate and not appropriate hit sessions or perhaps you have an example that could highlight some of that? Yeah, well, I think you said the um – Maybe the first point I want to make is is you mentioned it in there, and that is understanding context. So your listeners, they're going to come from a certain context. They're going to understand their their sport, and that's so key, and that's so critical, and that's you know that, that's um, maybe more important even than the the knowing the physiology. But now, if you can take your your context, and now you know some physiology and some some training science as well. And now you can take that into your context. Well, now you've just become a lot more powerful in, in your kind of your ability to program. So maybe, um, yeah. And I, and I guess, you know, how would I, you know, what would be a good example? Well, um, probably relates to, um, you know, some of the stuff that we were just speaking about. So maybe you're, uh, you're a team sport practitioner and you're, you're responsible for the, the programming of your team sport. And all of a sudden, and you, and you understand your context, and you understand how the different uh, um, sessions are lined up through the week. And um, but now, you know, but now you, you know, I guess after reading through this sort of stuff and taking the course, perhaps you um, you understand the science a little bit more, and you can, um, I guess, be, because you understand how interval training works, you know now how to, um, I guess, manipulate your your interval training 
and um, I guess program a little bit more appropriately. So um, you know you might uh, you might have a small sided game programmed a certain way, and then really when you're starting to look at it, you're realizing now based on what you've learned that it might not be the most appropriate session. You might be having more neuromuscular strain, uh, you know, glycolytic uh, or lactate, um, you know, um, a response that uh, that might not be a as appropriate as, as it could be or as good as it could be to um, to get the most out of your athletes and as a result you make some make some changes you might uh, you know change you know lower the um, lower the duration of the of the intervals um, you know change the um, you know, change the uh, the recovery durations accordingly change the intensity um, there's so many different uh, things and uh, that we kind of go through in the whole um, uh, through the, through the course. There's so many ways to sort of, sort of skin the cat, but it's giving you more tools in your toolbox to be able to to do that within the context that you already know as a practitioner. Definitely, and uh, you know, like as you mentioned, understanding those principles being just so key to the whole process, and you know. A lot, a lot of the coaches, if we talk about sort of that coach practitioner relationship, obviously, when when teams lose or if they're not playing well, sometimes coaches are are more prone to be um, putting athletes through sessions that almost seem like a type four those weapons of mass destruction that might be you know in the long run not not benefiting the the the, uh, the team. And so I think a lot of practitioners might might be seeing that when they go through this course or read the book that um, you know this communication between coaching staff and performance staff could uh, sometimes be a little bit better because those are some pretty taxing sessions, right? Oh, absolutely. And, um, yeah, and that's a whole other can of worms in terms of relationships between, uh, different parties within high performance settings and stuff. And that's, uh, that, there's always challenges in there, but, um, yeah, I guess it starts with a conversation. It starts with a little bit of knowledge and, um, yeah, c- courageous conversations, uh, as we often sort of say, need to be, need to be had and, and, uh, with, you know, with a little bit of, uh, background that's kind of behind them as to why you might want to do or consider doing something a different way. And then For sure. going at that kind of slowly, 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 possibly in, uh, uh, at the, at the right opportunity is, is usually, uh, the best thing you can do. It's not, there's no, um, I guess having worked in those environments, it, uh, I'm very well aware. It's a lot, t- a lot of times it's easier said than done. For sure. And then you know, this kind of dovetails into my next question here around, you know, stress, fatigue, athlete health. Um, you guys have devoted the whole chapter to this area and I know uh, athlete health and longevity is, is definitely an area of interest for you. Um, you know, so what, what are some of the themes perhaps that come up here when, when talking about hit training and, and, and athlete health. Sure, sure. So you alluded to it there. Um, Dr. Bubbs was was just the. I mean, we have to recognize first that that a lot of uh, a lot of hit, um, a lot of different types of hit sessions are high stress. Um, hit, you know, hit training is um, is stressful, and that is that that's not. You know, there, we don't have to take a negative connotation on that. That can be very. Um, in the healthy athlete that can be, uh, of highly, uh, of high benefit and, you know, athletes are resilient and they will typically, if they're healthy, they will adapt, but we can get too much of a, of a, of a good thing. And, um, yeah, if there's ultimately when there's too many type four sessions, uh, and they are, I guess, being, you know, uh, accompanied by other stressors in life, whether that's, you know, psycho, psychosocial, emotional, um, uh, you know, <laughs> waking up in the middle of the night with a, with a child that's screaming. Yeah. Um, life gets in the way, right? Exactly. Poor nutrition and all these sorts of things, you know, poor sleep, then it might not, not always be the, um, the most appropriate response. And, and again, we've, we've spoken about this before. It really so often comes back down to the individual. And um, uh, Phil, Phil Maftone, uh, I don't know if it's his, his saying, but I learned it from him. And he said that, you know, never treat a stranger. And that's why you, you really need to, um, yeah, yeah I, I think it's, it's really important to, uh, to know your athletes, um, as best you can have those, those great one-on-one relationships and, uh, you know, be able to ask those honest, uh, 
th- those questions and hopefully get an honest answer. And, uh, and then, uh, I guess change programs accordingly. So, so if, you know, if you know, an individual is under a high level of stress, um, it might be more appropriate to, to, uh, to run a type one session for them. Right. Remember that was the aerobic oxidative without the glycolytic or the neuromuscular load. Um, uh, and again, there's another practical example of, of why you wouldn't want to, uh, necessary or why you want to potentially use this type of uh, or sorry understand this information because it gives you more power as a as a practitioner when you're going to adjust training um and yeah yeah, and i guess i guess on the on the health thing as well is uh the it, it really comes down to um the probably the 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 biggest um confounder is uh it, it probably is the, the the diet unfortunately um this you know the the world that we live in is a is a course um is, it you know it's so easy to get access to uh j- you know it would just be termed junk food and um you know you as you know you you wind up getting a you know a, a chronic uh sort of level of inflammation if that's kind of in your chronic diet uh, and again, if you're adding stress in the form of HIT training to that, well, it's just a recipe for d- disaster. And this runs us into that that overtraining syndrome. And and I've seen this in my in my time at the at the call face. It's one thing as as a coach, um, I'm always you know ensuring that that or doing my best to ensure that my athletes are not not uh, not you know going down that line. And yeah, I think those are kind of some of the common pitfalls that we see within within the area. It's never, you know, it's never black or white. It's never one thing, but it's it's knowing your individual. Uh, don't treat a stranger, and um, uh, again, having you know, knowledge is power. So if you know how to manipulate some of these sorts of things, you can get people through those bad patches um, with a little bit of knowledge. Very well said. Yeah, definitely. I mean, those the sort of constellation of whether you know collection of biomarkers, symptoms, patient, client information. Um, and as you mentioned, just the power of some of this information here, you know, I'm thinking for a lot of, you know, sort of high level recreational endurance athletes is, you know, some that I see and I know a lot of practitioners and trainers would see who are often kind of default into that. Just harder is better. More is better. You know, lots of type four sessions. <laughs> I think this would, this is going to be really important information for, for those practitioners and trainers as well to be able to, to sort of manipulate some of those, training variables to help take some of that load off because I, I know I definitely see a lot of, um, you know, sort of those recreational athletes kind of redlining. And as you mentioned, you know, the junk food, the, the, the cravings for, you know, for sugar, for, for processed foods as, as they start to sort of get run down. So it's, uh, it's amazing yeah. how these things start to all become intertwined, right? Oh yeah, for sure. For sure. They, they do. And it's really, you know, it's really sad when you've got a, got an athlete in front of you and they you know you can kind of see it but they can't and um but yeah and it's uh <laughs> it's uh but, but the there's more of those cases out there than yeah than there is the other way i've at least i found when i was was working uh, directly in uh, i guess government industries um absolutely that that supported that and i will i'll just add on one thing to one of the things that you said i think it's the biggest misconception on hit training and that's the the whole no pain no gain mentality that is not good hit training like hit hit training was not meant to, it was not uh you know born um it, you know it's, it's history i'm sure Mar- uh, marty gabella went you know and, and told you all about this uh, and, and your listeners but it's you know, it was um, it was found, uh, you know, in the early 1900s as a, you know, a, a beneficial method of training. But it, they weren't, yep. you know, going to the well with all these sort of sessions. They were just going fast or going hard and then, and then kind of coming off. And they were they found that they were able to do, um, you know, more work in a sort of a shorter period of time, but it wasn't agonizing. And, you know, you see some of these things, I guess on social media where Definitely, there's, definitely. there's people, there's people that are just <laughs> Everything's absolutely, painful, yeah. yeah, going all in for, for these things. And there's, there's glory and glamor that's put behind that, but it really kind of, it's not proper training. So that is one of the, think, uh, the biggest min- misconceptions and that's, uh, hopefully we'll kind of, uh, you know, portray that that's 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 not the way we we go about our hit sessions 
we can be a lot more intelligent with, uh, with our, um, our programming. And, and, you know, I'll just add one thing on that too, is if we even, you know, not that this is God or anything, but like, um, you know, um, uh, Stevens, uh, Steven Seiler is, a, a f- uh, an exercise physiologist, uh, pretty well, uh, well-regarded one. And he's done this, um, uh, he's kind of, he calls it the sealer, uh, uh, hierarchy of needs for for training and any and that you know hit training is right up there but the one that's even above that is consistency of training awesome. and i truly believe that and it's 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 um you, you and it, the hit training is not going to be able to be performed if it's if it's performed to the well you know or all you know no pain no gain so you've got a um you should always uh, leave a hit session like you could have done one more. That's always the advice I'm I'm giving my athletes. Um, you make sure you pull out. You, you know, you easily could have done one more kind of thing if you, when you're doing that session. That's that's always the way you should kind of feel. And then you'll you know you'll back up the next day and you um, you can you can repeat it again or or two days later or whatever the um, you know the the formula that you're kind of using in your in your program. Yeah, great great advice and. Um... I was speaking with uh, Trent Sellingworth last week and that idea of consistency, you know, he'd mentioned around uh, Ilya Kipchoge's performance about the, the 10 or 15 years of training he'd done before that that could have, you know, built up and led into that performance. So that idea of consistency, I think, is definitely um, one that's that's not uh, emphasized enough, unfortunately, in the Instagram and in Twitterverse. Uh, oh, yeah, but it's... <laughs> it's everything, right? It's everything. It's everything. When I'm, I mean, that's the... So, you know, you know, we've got our little coaching business, Blues and Prof, and yeah, that is the biggest thing that we harp on to our athletes about is it's getting back up and it's, you know, consistent training day in, day out for, you know, it's it takes, yeah, it takes years sometimes of, of that day in, day out, consistent training, not missing a session. And I really like it when my, my athletes are proud that they've, you know, they've kind of gone through, managed themselves so well and that they, you know, when I'm saying manage themselves, it's, it's doing those sessions, walking away, always being able to do one more. And then also, um, you know, managing themselves away from training as well. So they're doing, they're, they're eating right. They're, um, they're going to bed at a reasonable hour. Their, you know, their sleep hygiene is excellent um and yeah that's and and i love it when they're proud that they're kind of doing that they to me that's an athlete that really gets really intelligent and they get it yeah you got it man awesome great insights here prof um before we wrap up last a couple questions for you um sure what do you think the evolution of hit science is in the next five or ten years (laughs) well that's a a, i know it's a big big one but uh (laughs) Well, I'll look. I'll tell you what the dream is, and and, it, and and maybe I might be wrong on this one, but you know, I always like to be honest. One of the things that I I'm really interested in the whole, um, uh, you know, the AI movement, and we've got you know we've got some great IP within here in terms of uh, intellectual property and and what we've kind of created in terms of our advice. And, um, we've got some great teachers, you know, right across, you know, just to be clear, we've got 20, you know, 20 of the world's experts that are embedded in high performance programs that are, um, the, I guess the lecturers for the application aspect. Um, and yeah. And, and I think one of the, the next, maybe the evolution, the five to 10 year goal that should keep me kind of busy is really trying to automate, uh, these training programs and I guess being able to do, um, you know, cause this, look, um, it's, it's not easy stuff. Uh, you know, it's taken me 20, uh, me and Martin, 20 years of, of investment of, of, uh, energy and whatnot in this. And, and Absolutely. but yeah, we want, I, we're kind of thinking that, that maybe we can somehow leverage some of the, the, um, the AI sort of stuff that's out there and try to automate some of these sorts of things and then integrate maybe with some, some of the the sensor technology that's out there. I mean, that's that's kind of growing really rapidly too. And and not to say we're ever going to take away from what the coaches kind of uh, does at the coal face, mm-hmm. um, but it's just uh, it, it's about creating another tool with some good um, intelligent logic that's kind of behind it. That might that might be the next thing that that we kind of that we kind of do. Um, at least that's what we're thinking right now. But I mean. At the moment, it's just it's all it's all in getting you know tw- twenty of the authors to um, you know get their uh, get their videos and and slides into me <laughs> and sure. uh, 
coordinating with the with with the um, elite HRV team, who have been excellent. I, I gotta I gotta say as well, they're they've they've got a great little infrastructure um, uh, that uh, they use for their um, HRV uh, foundations course that that uh, that they run, and we're yep. gonna basically be leveraging off of that. So huge huge props to them, huge thanks to them. They're they're amazing for us. Phenomenal. Well, I think the last question here is what everyone, all the listeners are, are waiting to hear is, which, you know, when is the book coming out and is there a timeline for the uh, online course release? Yeah, we're, we're hoping that, um, so the book is published by Human Kinetics. It's already up on their website. Uh, the, the date is earmarked for December 19th. Um, you know, I've, Martin and I have been going through loads of page proofs and uh, challenges throughout that whole process as, as any author does, but, um, you know, we're, we're on track to, to hit that target. And we want to also release the, at the exact same time, the, uh, the course we want to have both available for people, um, right, right in time for Christmas. <laughs> phenomenal, phenomenal. Well, listen, Prof, <laughs> where can people stay connected with what's going on at Hit Science and also with yourself to keep up with your uh, work and your fantastic research? Sure. So I'm a, I'm a Twitter guy. So if you want to follow me, it's, I'm a Paul B. Larson and, uh, uh, yeah. And we've also got, um, a hit science, uh, Twitter account as well. That's, uh, that's doing well. And that's, yeah, it's just, uh, hit, hit science at, at hit science. And then our website is hitscience.com. Awesome. We'll definitely include uh, the links there, uh, in the show 